have a great uh, session that um, I'm really delighted that you are able to join us today, um, dealing with something that I'm sure uh, each and every one of you uh, is addressing as part of your professional uh, uh, responsibilities. In terms of um, um, our interest in this program, uh, of course, we have had a history in Silicon Valley business uh, uh, addressing issues that are of contemporary challenges for organizations. Um, so, for instance, uh, we have two institutes. Uh, one is that is focused on innovation and entrepreneurship, and the second one, which is focused on sustainability. And both of these have been in the forefront of leading a discussion and a conversation about predominantly those dimensions that essentially characterize much of organizational change and growth nowadays, sustainability and innovation. So for us, uh, uh, the transition to get into supply chain was something that was very consistent with our profile of wanting to engage the community. We are an academic institution, yes, but we are primarily, if you look at our mission, we are focused more on taking academic knowledge and applying it to challenges that organizations face. So more from the application of theory to the practice of theory. So from that standpoint, uh, this uh, uh, um, uh, supply chain uh, 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 focus is in some ways I see as our evolution in this particular uh, uh, arena. So we have a great uh, panel today, and I will let uh, 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 Dr. Alkis Bazakopoulos uh, uh, to, to, to introduce them and, and do uh, a better justice uh, to their uh, profile, because I would not be able to do that uh, just speaking out here. But I wanted to um, essentially uh, um, talk a little bit about uh, um, some of the things that we'll be uh, addressing today. So, so of course, um, um, one uh, particularly good news that, that we wanted to share with you related to our interest in supply chain <laughs> management is uh, a new program that we are introducing that is focused on, uh, 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 on the supply chain management profession that perhaps may be of interest to some of you. Okay? Um, we'll have uh, uh, Dr. Vazakopoulos uh, introduce the panel. Um, we'll have a panel discussion but more importantly, this is something that uh, uh, I hope we would be able to engage in having a much more active uh, conversation with uh, uh, um, many of you, if not all of you, uh, especially in terms of your own experiences dealing with these uh, challenges in your respective organization. So I'm sure our panelists here uh, bring their own perspectives from their own organizations to uh, uh, the, the conversation today. But I'm sure the discussion will be much more enhanced to the extent that you are able to inform your own uh, understanding, and especially for the, 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 the professionals that are gathered here today. And in a sense, this is what characterizes much of our programming. As I said, our focus has always been on applying theory to practice and dealing with the contemporary challenges that organizations face. And, 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 uh, and we follow up with that. So uh, if I would take a very brief uh, uh, a few minutes of your time and talk about something that we truly feel uh, delighted in presenting to you. Uh, we are um, going to be the first institution uh, in the state of New Jersey that has been authorized to offer uh, um, uh, a program, a Master of Science, a graduate program that is exclusively focused on supply chain management. Okay? There have been programs that have offered supply chain management as part of a larger program such as an MBA. Uh, but we decided that uh, um, uh, a focus on supply chain uh, is, 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 is well needed in the market given the uh, growth in, in, the, uh, um, um, in, in the kind of skill sets and capabilities that is de increasingly demanded by organizations in terms of developing a much more holistic and a com comprehensive view of managing a supply chain as opposed to uh, uh, some sort of an ad hoc or piecemeal approach, and I'm sure uh, many of you can attest to th this, this particular need. So just uh, 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 a brief um, 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 <coughs> commentary about the programs. Uh, so these are some of the areas that we'll be focused on, and I don't, I, I'm sure you don't need me to 
talk to you about the importance of each of these various components. Okay? But the idea is to be able to develop this broad and conceptual understanding about the topic of supply chain and then apply it to how do you address the issues that organizations face increasingly nowadays. Okay? Um, <clears throat> whether it is in terms of uh, uh, disruptions in, in the supply chain, to uh, ensuring the integrity of, of, of your product uh, uh, right from uh, um, uh, raw material stage to, 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 to end user stage. Okay. So in a way we have looked at our uh, curriculum and designed it such that the capabilities that will be uh, 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 um, engineered uh, through this uh, uh, curriculum is going to be state of the art in many ways. And we feel confident about that because the curriculum in a way has been vetted by our program advisory board. And I'm not sure if you had a chance to visit our, our website and, and checked out some of the uh, um, um, very, I, I do believe, very distinguished uh, panelists uh, um, uh, who serve on that board. Um, but we have shared our curriculum with those individuals to ensure that whatever capabilities and skill sets that the graduates will be generating from going through this curriculum will indeed be uh, state of the art. <clears throat> so, in terms of the, uh, uh, the program, it is going to be a 30 credit uh, program uh, comprised of 10 credits and uh, we can you know, provide you with details if you are interested in any of these. Uh, essentially the bottom line is you will be able to complete the, the, the program in about 20 months. Uh, <clears throat> so essentially uh, this is how you earn your degree in, in about less than two years while still working uh, 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 full time. In terms of our, uh, um, who we are, uh, we are, uh, many of you may recognize the um, logo on the right there, uh, WACSP, which is the, by most accounts, the gold standard in terms of business school accreditation, uh, and, and certainly also recognize the Princeton Review uh, as to our credentials. Um, in terms of applying to the, uh, uh, the SCM program, uh, of course you can apply it online. Um, uh, we would require transcripts from more previous institutions and, and certainly we have uh, uh, Peter Caliguari and, and Dr. Gina Murray who will certainly assist you and Diane Pruden um, uh, who can uh, address any specific questions that you may have about, about th that particular process. Um, what we will need is a, a brief essay from you uh, in addition to your transcripts about how the SCM program would fit your professional goals, your career goals. And, and also a letter from your supervisor or your, or your employer recommending you to this program, okay? Um, we normally require a GMAT or a GRE uh, score for, for applicants. However, uh, if you have been working in the supply chain area for a few years, about three years, and you have an undergraduate GPA of at least 2.8 or above, um, uh, you, you, we would consider waiving the GMAT requirement for you. Um, there will be a committee that is going to be looking at your, 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 uh, your, your profile. So um, uh, based upon your essay, based upon your academic uh, uh, transcripts and your letter from your supervisor, the committee is uh, likely review your um, uh, credentials and uh, uh, allow you to waive the GMAT. Okay. And this is the piece that is just talked. So, so if uh, uh, um, uh, those of you who are attending uh, the event today and we decide to, to are interested in applying for the event, uh, you can receive a, a $2,000 uh, voucher that you can apply towards your uh, uh, tuition. So uh, in terms of the program, the program is going to be delivered exclusively on Saturdays. So again, as I said, you do not, you're not required to uh, um, um, uh, you can continue working full time and still uh, earn your degree in about 20 months. And the program is going to be delivered in a blended manner. So you don't have to come to campus uh, uh, every weekend. So essentially pretty much uh, um, uh, every other uh, week is when you will have to, every other Saturday is when you will have to come to campus. So it's, it's a program that, that uh, uh, I feel particularly strong about. Uh, uh, all of us, uh, uh, Dr. Paul Yoon, who is a department chair, of, um, has been very instrumental uh, uh, in, in establishing that program. Uh, and it's, some, it's, it's, it's a program that I, I, I do believe uh, uh, that um, will be extremely uh, um, valuable in terms of the kinds of skill sets and capabilities that is going to be developed. 
So without much ado, I will turn it over to Dr. Alkis Vazakopoulos to, to introduce us to, to our distinguished panel today and, and look forward to hearing some of the contemporary challenges that organizations face in the supply chain management. Thank you all of you for coming. You know, this is the first event we do. We hope to uh, continue these events, especially, you know, next semester when we start getting the first uh, cohort. We plan to have events like this. So this is our uh, first one. So we are, we are very happy to have here in order to have uh, the, the, the panel. Uh, first, we have uh, Ron Guido. Uh, he is member of our uh, uh, board. So let me give uh, some background about uh, Ron. Ron right now is an independent consultant and his uh, specialty is in uh, uh, protection, marketing and supply chain management. Um, Ron has 36 years of experience in, with uh, Johnson & Johnson. Uh, he has held executive level positions in the areas of operations and marketing, business development, information technology and general management. Uh, his most recent role was Vice President for Global Brand Protection uh, for Johnson & Johnson, where his group was responsible for anti-counterfeiting programs and policies. Uh, he continues to consult on the topic of supply chain, and he is broadly recognized by industry peers and government agencies as a leading authority on anti-counterterrorism practices and technologies. Uh, a parenthesis here, last year uh, we, we did an event for uh, 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 supply chain and counter uh, uh, fitting. We had around 60, um, 60 participants, great discussion we had. Um, he's a board member for a charitable medical organization known as Operation Smile and an advisor to the Rothman Institute of Entrepreneurship at Ferry Dickinson. And he holds three patents uh, for medical devices. Uh, Ron has an undergraduate degree in industrial engineering from Rutgers and a master's in management engineering from uh, NJIT. Thank you, Ron. Thank you. Next to Ron is Chris Sanahan. He, Chris is vice president for global procurement for Beckton Dickinson. Beckton Dickinson is a global medical technology company that manufactures and sells medical devices. I don't want it's not the uh, intent that we have uh, mostly medical devices uh, participants today, but um, so um, he joined BD in 2000 to establish the European arm of the newly formed uh, company procurement. In 2005, he moved to the US to lead global procurement worldwide along with five facility operations for the corporate offices global real estate and construction management. BD spends of uh, 4.2 billion has been the source to pay process leader. His, his team develops the overarching process that governs the chain of transactions from sourcing to payment on a worldwide basis. To drive sustainable change, Chris is focused on the integration of the procurement faction with the business units. His teams and leaders from the business units have overcame the traditional barriers to connect talent, tools, and processes. Chris is part of the company leadership team. Before joining BD, Chris served in leadership position in procurement, materials management, operations management, supply chain, with Smith Klein and Bisham, Sterling Drug, and Essilor in the UK and Ireland. And our ac academic panel member today is ALM. Aylen Koka is an assistant professor, or a very talented, I can say, assistant professor of operations management at the Silberman College of Business at Freddie Dickinson. Prior to joining Silberman College, he was an adjunct faculty at the Robert H. Smith School of Business at the University of Maryland, <coughs> where he received his PhD in operations management. He holds a master's degree in industrial engineering and a BS in mechanical engineering, both from Bokazisi University, Istanbul, Turkey. Dr. Koka has taught graduate and undergraduate courses on operations management, supply chain management, project management, statistics at FTU. And particularly, his research interests include operations marketing, marketing interfaces, closed loop supply chains, supply chain decision making, 
and of course ALM has published uh, uh, in, uh, in distinguished journals like uh, Production Operations Management and the Decision Sciences Journal. So we're very honored to have him in the faculty. Smile. So our discussion, I, I have prepared some questions. We'll go through uh, some of them. And then um, let's see your interest. And, uh, and we can uh, have uh, uh, questions from the audience. OK? So and our discussion is not necessarily, you know, we, we, we have an expert in, uh, in uh, um, supply chain and counterfeiting these days. So we'll try to get his brains as much as we can, because counterfeiting and fraud in the supply chain is very important. And not many people have the expertise. We have an expert in procurement. Procurement, the last 20 years, has been very, very important because it drives you know, uh, expenses in, in, the, in the supply chain. And ALM has the academic background, and you know, he's basically our connection today <coughs> with the academics. And we want to get uh, his knowledge about that. So I'll start with Ron first. So Ron, you are an expert in supply chain integrity, OK? And brand protection. So J&J, brand protection, big name. Could you help us why this is a big concern in the supply chain and uh, supply chain management mm -hmm. and uh, why increasingly it's going so and what do you see the trends there uh, you know sure. with the, the change that we're going to have there? I, I think to understand the question uh, more, you have to go back to the origin of our supply chains regardless of the industry. And when you think about it, there were really only two reasons why we created supply chains, and that's to get our products out as quickly as possible and to cover as much area as possible quickly. So it was all about speed and direction, spreading it. We really didn't design these supply chains and, and the processes supporting them with security or integrity in mind. We had this trust without verification. So over time, this has become quite an issue because there's tremendous profitability in developing a business if you're a bad guy around counterfeit uh, goods or gray market diversion of goods. And why is that? Well, uh, many reasons. One is we're now a global economy. So there's a lot, of, a lot more cross-border trade than there used to be. Uh, we've moved a lot of manufacturing from the west to the east to take advantage of the high labor content um, uh, over there and the low labor costs. Uh, we don't really have international treaties around integrity of supply. It's basically that, that trust with, uh, without verification. And the counterfeiters who have come up from many different ways, including some of them originated in the legitimate supply chain, they understand it very well, have realized this is a very profitable business. And, and don't think of a counterfeiter as someone who's trying to harm you. It's quite the opposite. They want to go undetected. So they want to give you benign fakes so that you don't look for them and you don't suspect that the product has been falsified. But a high reward to risk ratio exists, again, because of the cross-border trade. You make a product in one country, you transship it across a border, and from there, the supply chain takes over and many handoffs and so forth, regardless of industry. So I think the first reason is that the dynamics of world trade and the complexities of our supply chains, regardless of industry, have created this opportunity for uh, the rogue players, the counterfeiters, the gray market traders, to come in and take advantage of our lack of um, control and visibility into the supply chain. Thank you, Ron. So now a question for Chris. Um, traditionally procurement and purchasing process uh, in the organization, it was an administrative task. And uh, you can correct me on this, like, you know, 20, 30 years ago. And uh, something needs to be done. Now, this process now becomes more and more important. What do you see in there? Sure. So, um if you look at, if you look at uh, you know, everybody buys, 
everybody in the room is, is a buyer of some sort, okay? And we, we are, we're pretty good at buying as individuals. Um, what happens when you look at company profiles, most companies spend between 40 to 60% of their revenue. So they're giving it out to someone, okay? And it's usually a, you know, some, some supplier in, in play. So the traditional has been transactional. You know, I want it, give it to me today. I don't care and I don't care how much I'll pay for it. If you look at the evolution over the last you know, 20 years, and even if you go back to um, you know, 2001, 2008, and company, company pressures are, that are out there are both on bottom line and top line growth. Okay, there is much more pressure coming in on the bottom line for companies. Um, what we're trying to do really is create uh, revenue from, from, from the bottom in terms of making sure we're spending in a pretty smart way uh, from a company perspective to get the value from money and then be able to re reinvest in, on top line, top line growth, okay? And, and that's, it's, it's really a basic, it's, it's pretty simple um, in terms of, uh, you know, procurement. So we're known as buyers, okay? We're transactional. What we're trying to shift to is to be more value partners um, that we actually work with the business, uh, work with the executives to truly add true value across the full supply chain, which is much more than just transacting, okay? Um, and we can talk more to that later on. Aileen, I have a question for you. Um, we, you do research for supply chain and you see actually, you know, when we're in the academics, we don't see a lot about, you know, what's happening in practice. Um, but uh, where do you see research going um, between research and practice in the supply chain area? Where do you see, you know, what, what is the context there? Can you enlighten us and help us? You know, we, we see universities that, you know, they have these famous professors that they do, you know, they go do supply chain projects. They bring some of the research back into the, you know, they write case <coughs> studies. You know, we see those case studies at Harvard, you know, uh, that we use in our classes. So where do you see the connection between research and practice? And how do you bring that into the class? Well, uh, that's a good question. Thank you. Uh, in many uh, universities, that's correct that uh, we have focus in teaching, but uh, our teaching has to connect with real life and uh, our teaching has to uh, bring our uh, expertise in relation to the problems, the practices uh, that organizations uh, have to go through, the challenges uh, that they have to face. And if you look at all the uh, sophistication that we have in, in those practices and the overall understanding in the in the applications of, of all the methodologies, the tools that we have in the context of supply chain management. Uh, if, you, if you look at how they have formed historically, you can, you can I guess, uh, <coughs> branch it in, in two ways. Some part of it has been uh, a pull from the industry, from practice, and some part of it has been more of a push from academics, from the research side. And you know we can give a lot of examples of where uh, you see that push uh, from the academic side. Uh, good examples are, for example, uh, if you look back at all the you, you hear the word optimization uh, and all the optimization tools. That was one of the historic successes of academicians. <coughs> how they formed it after the Second World War. How they. Uh, put together the tools and how it actually attracted the practice and how it came to success from pretty much uh, becoming, being uh, very abstract mathematical tools to mathematical formulations to very practical, very powerful uh, tools that uh, enable all these uh, organizations to improve on their uh, bottom lines, basically. You know, we can open up from there, but uh, that is one of the most important uh, successes of uh, academia. Uh, well, mo most recently, we, we, if you if you heard uh, revenue management, the term revenue management, that's one of the important pushes from uh, the academia. 
Uh, so you hear applications, in, uh, especially in the service industry, uh, hotels, airlines, uh, the, the word when you hear overbooking. Uh, all that, the, the theory of it has been uh, pushed basically uh, from the academicians and welcomed by the practitioners. Of course, that the success of how well the academic, uh, academia uh, creates something and, go, and that goes into practice happens with collaboration. You know, uh, we can uh, go all mathematical and abstract all day, uh, but if I don't collaborate uh, with practice, if I don't collaborate uh, with real life, uh, then what I do uh, will be pretty much valueless. Uh, there is uh, always some uh, detail in theory that doesn't relate to practice, but especially uh, in a business school like us, uh, our focus is making that connect. Uh, our expertise in all the theory and our connections uh, with the industry uh, and all, all our basically uh, struggle is to, is to make that connection and to make it happen that we come up with something that can be uh, beneficial for the industries and uh, uh, recently uh, we hear the word analytics a lot uh, and that's our <coughs> most recent push from the uh, academics side uh, so you, you hear uh, every year uh, tons of conferences on analytics and new and new programs in analytics uh, to bring about that know-how from the from the resources side and to make it known more into into practitioners so that uh, they know its value they get to learn its value and uh, make use of it yeah and to 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 add on this i was teaching a course like 20 years back <coughs> in this in this building and a vp from boc gas boc gas i, I don't think exists uh, these days probably is uh, was taking the course and uh, you know he he left uh, you know he you know I, I i i taught a session for inventory management and after two weeks he came back and he says look i implemented this coq that you told us <laughs> and i saved like 20 million i project i saved 20 million dollars that was 94 it was a long time back mm -hmm. but before the class he didn't know about EOQ. Mm -hmm. students you know like in big organizations like inventory they still don't know about EOQ taking it back and <coughs> use it somewhere that they have a problem and gives them an advantage. So to add on this, there are many tools that uh, the, they can use. Now, going back to, to Ron, um, and during the, you remember during the, the, the mini seminar we had, we talked about what processes, supply chain process we can put to protect the integrity. Right. Can you basically sum up some of the stuff like I remember the home blood security guy talk about how he he cut the Louis Vuitton uh, fraud, uh, you know, by like fifty percent with some simple stuff they did. Right. But it's also it was legal. But can you give us on this? <clears throat> yeah, there's really no magic here. This any different than any other supply chain challenge that we have. It's really a mobilization of people, process, and technology to bring to bring to bear on this particular challenge. So if you look at um, the people, it's, it's first having the awareness that you may be being violated by counterfeiters or diverters. Um, and get that message out throughout your organization so that people are sensitized to the fact that there's a certain percentage of trade that is done on your products that you're not, not uh, aware of. So for instance, we all have uh, product complaint departments. Well, maybe someone's complaining about a product and you just say, okay, we'll log it in uh, and we apologize for that, we'll send you a coupon for a replacement. By asking a few more questions, like did you buy this in the same place you usually buy it? Was the labeling different? Did you notice anything unusual? You could now look at inside your own process, inside your company on the product complaint area and maybe identify some areas where there's false trade. On the process side, it's basically paying attention to all those processes of supply chain management that have a certain level of efficiency and effectiveness and try to improve those. So for instance, your upstream suppliers, 
Do you have agreements with them? Are you auditing them? Do they have agreements with you where they're not going to source their raw materials that go into your products from anyone other than who's been you know, certified or qualified by you? Uh, do you know where all your products are sourced from? On the downstream side, do you have agreements with your distributors, uh, whether it be wholesalers or, or secondary distributors, to say that they're not going to purchase your product from anyone other than you and have them align down to their uh, customers the same way, that they make sure that they're selling into a known customer that, that's been uh, validated. So if the supply chain integrity is what you're trying to achieve, it's a matter of, of putting the, the uh, agreements in place and then auditing. And then when you look at returns coming into your business, it's possible that counterfeit goods can come back into your company. Now, if you restock products and you're not checking for it, in essence, you are selling counterfeit goods through your own channels. So interrogate those products. How you do that? It's the third part of, of the challenge. It's people, process, and technology. There are technologies out, out there, and we can go into that later, that could help you authenticate either the product or the package surrounding the product. So just to pay attention to, and not trust, but verify through pro product, uh, excuse me, technology, process, and the people and the awareness that helps uh, provide this supply integrity. Thank you, Ron. Chris, procurement. Mm -hmm. uh, traditionally, you know, our thinking, you know, now we teach courses in procurement negotiations, okay, so it's, you know, our, our students, they will get, you know, ideas there. But traditionally, it was basically lowest price 20, 30 years back. What are the challenges today in, uh, you know, for your process and as procurement officer? Like, what are the big challenges? Sure. So, so if you think about traditionally, it's good, fast, cheap. Okay, that's, that's really, and you can pick any of those two and, and you're doing a good job. Uh, and, and, that's, and that's, that's sort of a mentality that still could be out there uh, in industry um, today. And as you mature in, in sort of procurement as a function, um, really what you're looking to is moving, moving up the value chain. Okay, so procurement goes beyond, you know, lowest price. Okay, it really goes after a range of areas. And we look at it in terms of um, assurance of supply. Okay quality, okay, the service, really around cost, but it's total cost, okay, it's regulatory, risk, innovation, um, they're, they're all aspects that you have to build out when you look at challenging the organization around thinking. It's behavioral, okay, so there's, there's the process, and, and when you talk about process, people call it source to pay, procure to pay, rec to pay, you know, it's from that idea and need through to that payment of to the supplier and, and the impact you have across the organization in here uh, is pretty pretty substantial, both from a, an efficiency perspective of, of maximizing how you actually do the work to being really effective about delivery back <coughs> into the organization. And what's happening is it's going broader, okay? It's going into the reputation risk for the company. Uh, you, you're really getting after the things that the supplier can do for you can actually impact your revenue as you move forward. So counterfeiting is clearly an area that we you know that, that's out there. The environment generally, environmental safety uh, elements as you look at supply and your suppliers and where they're based. Emerging markets, you know, everybody's saying we're going to emerging markets. There's a lot of implications around that as you look at your supply base. But it also applies in the US or in Europe. You know, there's no, um, no matter where you go, you can uncover things that you would say that shouldn't happen here. And, and their type, the, the sort of, the complexity associated with that, and you look at it differently to price, okay? And, and that's really what you have to do. And I think the value uh, that you bring to the table in, in, in the procurement space, broadening into supply chain, into operations, okay, is, is pretty substantial. And it goes beyond manufacturing because it goes into your services area, okay? So it goes into the G&A arena, which more and more companies are looking at around how do you actually deliver on the services side uh, for, for the organization. And this is all spend, it's all about how you manage it and get maximum value. Uh, and that's, that really moves away from that concept of price and, and, and low, you know, get the lowest price. Excellent. An interesting topic is risk. And, uh, and I'll talk about the program, like, and in general, you know, for, for, from academic 
um, in relation to supply chain risks, what skill does the program aim to build to the students that they will take the program and graduate? So, and you know, I want to bring the idea of risk, you know, mm -hmm. into the, the picture so we can continue. Absolutely. Uh, well, to answer that question, I guess you have to go back and see uh, the involvement of, of our supply chains. Uh, there was a time when, when it was all about just pushing products, when it was all about, uh, just like Ron said, uh, it was all about spreading, being uh, just uh, productive and uh, producing as much as you can. Uh, there was a time when, in terms of supply chain processes, you could set it and forget it, uh, but no longer. And what happened? Well, uh, competition happened. And uh, how did that come about? We talk about all the sophistication in the tools and uh, knowledge base that we have overall. Uh, basically, what happened is uh, the capabilities became more accessible in terms of uh, overall being able to present, being able to be present in the market. So market barriers uh, was no longer. And uh, you could have uh, more companies the, then you can count all of a sudden imitating your products, uh, just uh, not necessarily replicating, but competing with you in a pretty legitimate way. And uh, see, that forced uh, companies to, to come up with uh, efficiencies, right? You couldn't just say it and forget. You have to be uh, proactive about what you, what you can do, about uh, tapping into your capabilities, improving your uh, uh, value creation and lowering your costs. Uh, so, uh, and what tools we, we came about with that? For example, we have lean manufacturing. We have understandings of just in time, not just in terms of manufacturing, but all over the supply chain. And uh, other efforts like uh, outsourcing, uh, trying to uh, reach out to more supplies as well as markets. Uh, but that caused something else. Now we have way more points of breakage. So if you look back, uh, you, we companies were more, were more focused, more regional. Uh, now they collaborate with more companies. They share more information with other companies. Uh, they, that, that just in time understanding requires that everything works like a clockwork and if anything breaks pretty much anywhere then it's going to uh, like a domino effect affect the rest of your supply chain. That is what is the status of our supply chains now. Uh, very vulnerable to all kinds of uh, disruptions and what we want to do in this program to create this understanding uh, in our students, uh, this seeing the big picture of not just uh, thinking of supply chains as just pushing and competing in the market, uh, but observing also that uh, something subtle not everybody observes. There's competition across the supply chain. There's competition in terms of supply. There's competition in terms of technology in terms of uh, materials, all kinds of resources, in terms of skill sets. Uh, and uh, if you stay still, you are bound to uh, be forgotten. And we have tons of uh, failure stories. Uh, you know, there was a company called Kodak. Uh, Dell used to be much more than it is now. HP uh, used to be much more than it is now. And those are some companies, examples, who couldn't keep up with uh, what's going on. And uh, we want our students to be aware of uh, that dynamics uh, and uh, in terms of the general skill sets. Uh, and uh, when, when they look at uh, an operation of, of an organization, we want in, in any uh, position that they are, we want them to be able to understand uh, the, uh, the inputs and output processes, to be able to understand uh, where improvements can be made, to be able to understand uh, where uh, there are opportunities 
other than just uh, meeting uh, the minimum, what, what can they improve upon, what can they uh, create uh, in terms of uh, additional value, additional, uh, additional uh, know-how for their organizations. Uh, so I think, uh, to put it generally, uh, that broad skill uh, would enable our students to become uh, real leaders in wherever they are. Excellent. Excellent. Ron, I have a question for you. <laughs> now, you told us about the importance of, you know, the counterfeiting. But I will ask you, do we have technologies, like supply chain technologies, to fight this? That's one. Do we have methodologies to look at the risk and, and, uh, and uh, like, monetize it? Right. And also, what kind of technologies can be used so we can buy them, go to Chris and ask them for like $10 million to buy those technologies because there is a reason. So do we have, you know, you, you are experienced with J&J &J all these years. Yeah. Now you see everything that's happening around the world. Yes. What do you see there? Okay. Do we have technologies and... Yeah, uh, as, as counterfeiting continues to grow and we're aware of the, the risk associated with counterfeiting, there's been um, a, a, an equal amount of technology coming forward to be used uh, for anti-counterfeiting purposes, or at least to identify fakes from genuines. So all technologies in this space fall into one of two categories. It's either authentication, which is at a point in place, or it's track and trace, which tracks the movement of products. So if you have a product and you're trying to interrogate it to find out, short of any chemical analysis or sending it back to a lab, if you want to identify is this genuine or not, what the uh, brand uh, owner would do is place some sort of marking on the package or on the product inside the package and you interrogate that at a point in time. So I see product at a customs facility and I want to know if it's genuine or not. So you take a scanner and you look at the package and maybe you've buried inside the label, you know, inside some ink, a tag ant that lights up and gives you a pass fail because only you know it's there and you've got to believe a counterfeiter would not have known it was there. The first generation of those authenticating marks you may be familiar with, they're things like holograms or color shifting inks on labels and so forth. And now they're almost a joke to the industry because the counterfeiters do that even better than the brand owner does. Uh, I know a company very well who discovered uh, a cream, a, a cosmetic cream, in a warehouse in Russia, and the cream had a hologram on it. Well, the genuine product did not carry a hologram. <laughs> so the counterfeiter was just showing off and giving it that air of authenticity. So a lot of things you can do to interrogate a, pr a product at a point in time. You don't know where it came from, and you don't know where it's going, but at that point in time, you could extract it from the supply chain if it's fake. But of course, you've got to have the secret scanner that interrogates, so if you don't know what you're looking for, it's, you know, it's technology that falls on deaf ears, so to speak. The second category is becoming more popular, and it's more about tracking the movement of product. And it requires that each handoff in the supply chain has the knowledge to scan into their facility and out of their facility, into their truck and out of their truck and so forth. And that gives you, particularly if it's some geo-positioning technology used with a mobile device, now you can look at the integrity of the supply chain from the standpoint of it didn't go off uh, where it's not supposed to. Having said all that, we don't have enough technology. I think the, the counterfeiters, it's a game between, you know, they'll falsify things that they see. In some cases, you bury some of these tag ins or covert markings so deep into the package that even the good guys can't find them. So we need more technology, and in my department, we had a, 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 um, uh, a, you know, a philosophy that if any technology camp company knocked on our door and said, I want to show you our stuff, we would invite them in. Because maybe they don't have a full solution, but combined with somebody else's partial solution, we can get something that's unique. So technology plays a big role in authenticating product in the field or in a, in a, you know, in a retail center or at a consumer's um, a home and then track and trace gives you a little more assurance. It's a lot easier to catch a counterfeiter 
if you nab the product when it's in their possession because someone at a point of trade interrogates the product and said, right here, right now, it looks like it's a legal trade taking place and you could summons the law enforcement on that uh, transaction. So not enough technology, but it's, it's getting better. Excellent. <clears throat> Chris, um, now in BD, what type of uh, purchasing procurement strategies do you implement to address the challenges and also create uh, or, you know, capabilities in the organization uh, through your departments, like through purchasing and procurement. So, so one of the things that really interests me about this particular program, right? So it's, it's a master's in supply chain and then sort of been going after this procurement um, stream as we go through this is that we, we are a people-based strategy, okay? So we, we're very focused on, on uh, putting in place a pretty structured um, program around how we address the procurement agenda for the company. Uh, and it, it starts with people and capability. Um, and what we find is that as we look at that is that the type of person that used to go into procurement used, used to just fall into it. You know, I got nowhere to go. You get people, well, I'm going to do procurement and that's really where they end up. And that's, that's, that has been the tradition. That's where I started. You know, I said I didn't know where I wanted to go and I ended up buying stuff, okay? So that's where I got here today. Um, but the reality of it is that this is a profession and, that, and that's what we really struggle with as peers in industry here as well is how do we make it even more of a profession? And it comes back to ensuring that we have the right capability, okay? Uh, and we're very focused on competencies and competency development and structured training to get after making sure we have the right person in place. From there then, you deploy the resource correctly to actually match up to the needs of the organization. Okay, so that, and that, that will vary. Um, and, and the more complex the work is, the more, you know, you, you look at the, the capability and, and the actual associate and, and you funnel that in there. Now, if you went out there today on the net, on the web and said, what's the cost to hire someone? Okay, so you can get a transactional person, you know, at a low end, you know, at that th sort of thirty to fifty thousand dollar range, but they won't be in New Jersey. Okay, so so you don't place the transactional activity usually in New Jersey, but as you go up, you know what you're looking at that high end complex, and it's really a business partner getting after true business issues. You're competing with a lot of high professions out there um, in terms of hiring. Okay, and and that's what we what we go after. Uh, and then we assign, and, and it's really a people strategy. That's, that's what it's about. I'm really excited about this program to see can I actually get you know, some talent coming in so we can actually expand that. Good. So, Eileen, elaborating on this, you see and we see the supply chain profession and the talent has changed the last 15 years. Right. And we recognize that. What do you see in there? What, what, what is the future in there? You know, Will we need more talent and in what areas? That's a great question. Uh, well, if you, if you look at the, uh, from the supply chain uh, side, the kinds of skills that are demanded, uh, it's becoming more and more analytical. It's becoming more and more technical uh, because, well, I guess, continue from my previous uh, discussion, competition is fierce, so you have to uh, improve on the tens of percentages, one thousands of percentages in terms of uh, your uh, your efficiency, in terms of your uh, cost efficiencies, in terms of creating value. How do you come about with that? Used to be, you know, rules of thumb just worked. Now you need <coughs> really sophisticated tools. You read, you need sophisticated approach uh, in terms of uh, the technical side uh, to to improve. Uh, the capabilities of your organization and uh, you, that's why you need the, the skills to be able to, be able to actually do that uh, and uh, not necessarily you have to be a mathematician uh, the tools that we have are actually so good that uh, you just need to understand how to use it and how to what to make out of it so uh, uh, it's, it's you know as a decision support mechanism uh, and uh, we hopefully uh, will build such skills. Uh, so we are a business school. Uh, we're not going to talk about 
mathematical theory uh, in, in that much depth as a PhD program would do, but uh, more focused on uh, how certain uh, commonly available, uh, for example, optimization tools, statistical tools, simulation tools <coughs> uh, can be used to, to improve upon uh, the existing processes and to devise uh, new processes. Uh, so in terms of the talent, uh, the you know, I don't know if you, you're following, but uh, analytics has been uh, really the demanded uh, profession now, uh, the field now, because of how powerful it is in terms of uh, enabling organizations uh, to improve their bottom lines. And it's becoming more and more uh, commonplace and uh, widespread because uh, as the competition gets uh, fiercer, uh, organizations are realizing that they, they need uh, those te technology, the, they need those capabilities to, uh, to be able to actually exist in the market. Uh, so if you uh, read the research on this, uh, millions of openings in the next uh, 10, 20 years uh, there will be in terms of analytical skills. Uh, so uh, we hopefully will create the, the graduates who will be able to fill up such positions. Uh, not necessarily they, they have to do anal analytics themselves, but uh, they will have the skills to interpret uh, and understand <coughs> the tools uh, and to put those into action. So now let's talk about suppliers. So in <coughs> the supply chain, the companies that uh, you know you've been working like uh, they are, they don't have the market power like Walmart has to bring the suppliers and you know uh, in the integrating the supply chain. Now for the problems you have, you need uh, you know for those integrity issues you need cooperation with suppliers. Mm -hmm. How are you looking to get their help? to okay. achieve, you, you know, the goals against, like, for, for a decade man, a brand. Sure. So, you know, we talked before, we said uh, common problems across any vertical, any industry relative to supply chain integrity is the relative lack of information and control that any one entity has in the supply chain. You're relying on the integrity of upstream partners and downstream partners. And, and there's a belief, an archaic belief, that if you're, for instance, a distributor, your power is in harboring information and not sharing it with your upstream partners and your downstream partners. Because if you did, the fear is you'd be disintermediated out of the chain. And, and that's becoming uh, a fallacy. In fact, if you were looking for increasing supply, uh, visibility and control, it's all about sharing information, sharing big data, sharing supply demand information, sharing information about channels of trade and pricing and so forth. And if you do that within the good guys, if the good legitimate organization shares information, everyone's gonna win because the losers will be the profiteers on the outside of the legitimate supply chain, the diverters and the counterfeiters and so forth who are leveraging the demand that you've created and they're filling that demand. You should fill the demand that you create, 100% of it. So looking at whatever we can do to increase the visibility from end to end is important. And what we're talking about here and some of the curricula, uh, uh, the, the training and the, and the education that we're looking at, it's really about managing big data, managing relationships, looking holistically end to end at a supply chain and optimizing that. And that takes real talent. And, and if I may just digress for a second, when I entered my professional career 40 years ago, I was an engineer supporting the manufacturing process. I had one directive, lower cost. I was a necessary evil to the business. You know, if I could cut costs two, three, five, ten percent a year, it's gonna impact the bottom line. I was bottom line oriented. The top line uh, success came from sales and marketing. So much so that if there was talent in the supply chain, we'd evacuate that, the, I mean, as far as we'd move them to sales and marketing. Today in Johnson & Johnson, 
about 7% of our total work workforce of 128,000 people worldwide, 7% are in sales and marketing. 45% are in the supply chain. And the reverse has taken place. Now our talented, brilliant, analytical people are now taking positions like procurement or you know, supply chain management. And, and I believe that's the place to be. And I've been all over the company, but I've gone full circle from starting in the supply chain and now coming back and seeing the importance of supply integrity, for instance, which is a relatively new aspect of supply chain management. When I mentor young people just starting out in their career, I said there is no place that I'd rather be than in supply chain management because it's so diverse, it's so exciting. And the other dynamic to keep in mind, it used to be sales and marketing was important because people had to be sold to. You had to convince people to buy your product. You know, so you had all these great sales pitches and you had to you know, create demand by uh, changing people's minds. Now the consumer is more intelligent. They want to be served. They don't want to be sold to. They want to be served. <laughs> Who serves them? It's the supply chain. And the supply chain is probably the biggest asset in the company to drive both top line through fulfillment and bottom line through cost management. To, to interject here, uh, there's an example I, I give in my classes. Uh, many people, uh, not to uh, debate about it, uh, think of Steve Jobs as a visionary. You may agree or disagree, but uh, who, uh, when, as he was leaving, who did he trust the company to? Not a marketing person. He trusted his little baby <laughs> to a supply chain person, right? So his vision was that uh, that will be what's going to drive Apple from that point on. He, Apple didn't need sales pitches anymore. Apple needed to fulfill their promise of giving, you know, providing uh, high quality uh, products. And only through supply chain you can do that. Excellent. Chris, a similar question now about again the suppliers. You know, mm -hmm. you are a multinational company and you supply all around the world, but now you have to customize medical devices, you know, in, because you have regulators in every country. Mm -hmm. You are in the procurement. This is a big problem for you. So what, is, what are the challenges there? What do you see in there? We so, did that case in the yeah, class. So, so, so building a story here, so, so we have, well, like we, we, most people have got a syringe in their arm at some stage in their life, I'm sure. Um, and if you look at that syringe, it's uh, what we call a tier one syringe in the US, okay? It's high quality, okay? If you, if you get a, a little, you know, the needle sharpness on that over the years has got thinner and thinner, so we're sort of making it more painless. That's what we'll sell. Um, so, so that's a tier, what we call a tier one syringe, okay? So emerging markets, we want to expand. Can you bring that tier one, sir, tier one syringe into a, an emerging market and get the same price? Okay, uh, uh, with, with that sort of customer base, the answer is absolutely not. Okay, so it, it, what we had to do, what we, what working with the, um, with the supply chain operational group and ourselves working with the businesses, is we had to design a product, okay, and source it in, in region, um, which is what we call greener. So it's actually out there in the marketplace today, it's called Emerald, uh, and we took a significant amount of cost out of that, but we also had to make sure we had the sourcing correct in region and in a way that follows all the principles of reliability okay so if you follow anyone goes on and listens to our analyst calls we talk about re reloco which is reliable low cost okay and it's really around reliability and making sure you get the lowest total cost as we go through this but it, it's really impactful okay and, and as a procurement professional in here and I'll, I'll say it's procurement which is part of what we call the integrated supply chain in many ways in, in our organization but it's really meaningful that we're actually contributing to a top line play, but it's also something that we can get and get to consumers that can afford it. Okay, and, and that's really about affordability and the, and the you know, healthcare costs across the world you know, are, are challenged out there. So that's really a, a, a sort of pride that we have be, being able to get something at a little do, lowest total cost basis, but to help our top line in many ways. And it, you know, would we have done this sort of 10 years ago? Probably not. Well, I know we wouldn't have. 
we wouldn't have been at the table, okay? So it's really been at the table to actually do that. Uh, and this product, it's called Emerald, but we have plenty of other examples like that. Excellent. So I think now it's your time, you know, if you have, uh, let's, you know, get your questions. Yes. I do, I do have a, a question, um, a real, real life question. Um, I understand this, the supply chain, the supply chain management and the processing and the procurement and the analytics and everything that goes into it. How do you deal with the challenge that's happening today? And, you know, I'll, I'll spell that out. The challenge that's happened on the West Coast, uh, planning was there, and everything's at a, at a standstill coming through the Port of LA Long Beach. Um, thousands of containers. Major, major retailers are spending hundreds of thousands of dollars for special gates. Um, the driver, the driver uh, capacity has shrunk from 19,000 drivers down to 10,000 drivers. Rates have gone up, costs have gone up. It's impacting the supply chain, impacting the economy. There's no solution. The plan was there, and all of a sudden it's hit a, hit a stone wall um, with the you know, contractual negotiations that are going on with the ILWU. CNF filter into like the Port of Norfolk, not so much down in Savannah. How do you deal with that? And it's not just, it's not just union contractual negotiations that's going on. It's the infrastructure at the, at the port. So 14,000, 15,000, 13,000 TU vessels coming in. They don't have the infrastructure. They don't have the capacity. It's taken three or four or five days you know, to unload a vessel. How are they going to deal with that as our supply chain continues to expand? West Coast brings in 15, 15, uh, 15 million TUs a year. You know, it's one of the top seven or eight ports in, in the world. Uh, if they can't deal with the volume coming through, you know, from Asia, from around the world, how how is that going to impact the supply chain? How is it going to impact our economy? You know, how, how do we deal with this? Open up to so anybody in the audience. I, I'll, I'll offer a thought. If you bring it down to what evolved inside a company, remember we used to have something called WIP, work and pro right. process, right? So everything was stage gates, and you had to have a quality check before you move it on and move it on. And now we kind of have quality built into the operations where there's validation through each step of the way. I think on a global basis, we've got to learn how to have a continuous flow of product and not have as many stage gates. And what do you have to do upstream to pre-qualify each of those steps so that you don't have a bolus of inventory sitting in one place at risk for things like labor breakdown or, or capacity variances and so forth. And I think if, as we continue to have more visibility and control on the supply, how things were made upstream, where they are today, and get governments to cooperate, it's no different than the long lines you have going through security. We've come up with a TSA process, pre-certified. I think that's the kind of thing we need to do more and more for our goods so that we're not vulnerable to these exceptional uh, problems that happen along the way. It, it's, it's easier said than done, I realize that, but I think we need to look at a global, if we're truly talking about a global supply chain, we've got to put uh, some technology in place, some new process in place to have a continuous flow. And, and I agree with you 100%. I, I just don't see it as a, a quick fix. I mean, you know, I see it, it's, it's going to, you know, they have to change the whole infrastructure, the whole process, and, and you know, it's, it's costing millions and millions of dollars to get that product to the West Coast now. I have a procurement question, I guess Chris would probably be the best to answer it. Um, I'm, I'm on the transportation side, so procurement is kind of a, a, a dark art, I guess. I, I get sort of the, um, you know, here's the cost of the good, here's the cost to transport it to the, to the marketplace. Those are, to me, tangible costs. The inventory carrying costs, those are tangible. But how much weight do you put on when deciding who to get your product from, on government stability, on the quality of that supplier, on, you know, how reliable that production company can be to make it? I mean, is it it's 80% price and 20% these sort of other intangibles. I mean, how do you make those purchasing decisions? So, so 
it depends, right? Real consultants aren't answered there, okay? <laughs> so, so the way the way it works, well, the way it works for us is that um, you start with requirements, okay? Um, and the requirements are driven by the business, okay? And within within our company, we got eight different units, so each business has different needs. Uh, and and basically, what we do is we sit down with um, with with a team within the business and go through things like you're referring to. So price, okay? They'll call it price. Quality service, you know the um, ri the risk you're willing to take. Okay, um, are you looking for anything around innovation out there? There's there's a piece you know in our in our place around compliance in particular is actually probably, you know it's, it's just, this this compliance issue is coming out left right and center across the world. Okay, so what we do is we sit down and and we look at that and we ask them to wait it. We we get them to weigh that, okay? Because um, naturally we're going to say, well, the price is the most important thing, okay? But we have no decision rights around it, right. okay? So so what we do is we weigh it, and that's what drives it. So 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 price. I've never seen price in our case being higher than thirty percent in our decision making process, okay? Um, now what happens is you meet all the other factors, and then the business will say, well, get me more, right? So that's that's where it gets a wee bit tough, but. But it's, it's, it's really pretty a blended, and we don't always go for the lowest, uh, lowest provider. And, and, and nine times out of ten, we never take the lowest provider. Okay, but it is a methodology that you have to, you know, to, to actually go through. And just sort of a follow-up question, to, and to touch on just gentleman's comment. You know, what do you do if there's a disruption? Like, you know, a few years ago, there was a strike at LA Long Beach, and, you know, there were ships stacked up for days. Screen? It's how, you know, how quickly can you react? I guess again, it comes down to well, it comes down to your risk, your risk profile. Okay, so you really need to understand your risk profile of your supply base. Okay, and and the supply base goes to where does you know, if something's coming in through a port? If something happens in that port, do you have a mitigation? Mm -hmm. So so we do we do look at about ten different types of risks. Okay, and I'm not say we have a plan for every single one, but we try to identify the highest risks, and we link it to our product, and we link it to the margin of product. Okay, so so if I look at our product portfolio and take the 80-20 rule, on the major margin contribution to the company, we make sure we have those buttoned down, and we just recognize we're not going to be able to supply in some cases, and we have to take that risk in in, in our profiling. Um, but it's it's. It's just part of business, unfortunately, and um, you know we can have plenty of examples where that goes on. But enterprise risk management is critical, and that needs to start at the board level. Yes. I have a twist on the security question. We're getting a lot of pressure from retailers to help them think through retail theft and help them sort of uh, solve that issue, which I find interesting because it's really their issue and not our issue. But um, there's no standardization, as I'm sure you're well aware, around the technologies. So they are putting pressure on us as a manufacturer to tag, uh, source tag and checkpoint, uh, which of course increases our cost of goods, it, it causes all kinds of sort of skew proliferation, et cetera, and pressure on our supply chain, to which we'd love to say no, but they don't really believe that as an answer. And I'm just wondering if there's an emerging sort of point of view from a, from a industry point of, uh, point of perspective. Yeah. I think the emerging point of view is that this is the new way of doing business. It's unfortunate that it's, it's common now in the world of theft, uh, legal trade of, of all kinds, and I think it's a new cost of being in the game. And we're just seeing the tip of the iceberg now, but if we're sitting here 10 years from now, I think every one of the products we have would, be, uh, would have something, including every piece of fruit and every food stuff would have some way of authenticating its value. The trick is to mitigate the cost induction of those things by delivering other business-related value. So again, supply-demand balancing, tracking of new products, um, maybe simplifying the returns process, simplifying the recall process. I think if you have more visibility and track and trace technologies associated with everything, it's a heck of a lot easier to then manage that, that inventory when disruptions take place. So I think we're only seeing the, the tip of the iceberg and it's the world we live in. We never thought we'd be stopped at security going on to airplanes. Now we, we accept it because it's built into the world of travel. And I think the same thing, unfortunately, would be in every 
professional or consumer goods that's traded around the world. Can cost get passed along or absorbed? It's, it's both. You know, it may be a higher cost, but it's a cost of integrity. And we're going to recognize that because we can't afford not to authenticate the products, particularly the things that are ingested uh, or, you know, have some bearing on its health and safety. I think, you know, if we knew how many airline parts and automobile brakes and so on are counterfeit, uh, you may not do any travel. Uh, but that's what's happening. And, and the good counterfeiters are not trying to harm you, but in the course of doing their profiteering, um, they don't pay attention to quality. And it's just going to be around for a long time. And it's not just the Louis Vuitton handbag say, well, that doesn't hurt anyone. Yes, it does. There's this strong evidence that the counterfeiting network that makes the handbags are also connected to terrorism. So, so I think the reality of it is you can't push the cost up. <clears throat> okay, so for companies, you have to figure out how to actually mitigate the cost. And that's what's going on. You, you can see it happening today. People are buying, they're merging, they're trying to actually do synergies, they're, they're pushing backroom stuff out. You know, if you go into, our, into the world of G&A and, and indirect uh, spend, companies weren't looking at that five, eight, ten years ago. Now you can't get the people to actually go and do the work, right? So, it's, it's, um, so the reality is there's more and more of this going on. And every day there's something new coming out and you're just expected to figure out how to c cover the cost. Yeah, and that's, that's the reality that we will face. Yes. This is a two-part question, uh, two separate subjects. First part, you know, the scalability and responsiveness of the supply chain is often related to the accuracy, accuracy of the forecast. And many, many years of doing it, I've heard it, I've seen it firsthand, forecasts tend to be heather lucky or lousy. So the question there is, are the best practices, tools, and techniques uh, that have emerged or are emerging that drive better forecasts and therefore put more responsive supply chain? And the second part is just your comments on the concept of supply scorecards and you know, any pros and cons or experiences our company is on the verge of embarking on supply scorecards. So one comment on the first part of the question. Um, I think when you look at, um, I'm sorry, the first part was the forecasting. We've got to take the forecasting out of the hands of the marketing people. And, and really it's demand signaling that should drive a forecast. And the faster we can turn around a trend in demand over to the supply side is the better off we're going to be. Because when you think of it, no uh, worthy marketeer is going to say, I forecast a reduction in sales next year. So you gear up all this infrastructure, all this capacity with long lead times based upon someone's optimistic forecast. And then you're building to that forecast instead of producing to demand. And I think the quicker that we can take true demand and blend it back upstream into the supply network, that's going to give us the, the, the proper amount of it. But it's not, it should not be based about on um, you know, what kind of sales objectives do we need to meet next year. So the, on the on the scorecarding one, um, scorecarding is important but on the supply base, but it's really identifying and segmenting. You can't you, know, you can't sort of measure every single supplier. So you need to put some kind of segmentation mechanism in place, and then you need to you know go after what you want to measure. And, and everybody does it differently. The one watch out in here is all around behavior and people's discipline. Okay, so if you go back to the planning and the planning of, of materials coming in, using that as one example, if someone doesn't actually put the right data in, you're going to get garbage, okay? And that's, that's the reality of it. So, so that's part of the process discipline that needs to go on as you go through it. I do think scorecarding and dashboarding is really important um, to trend what's going on. Sometimes it's trends, okay, because of, because of that behavior. Um, in terms of the forecasting coming back to it is we, we tried as a company, I think it was five or six years ago now, by putting in a bonus factor into the sales guys if they didn't forecast correctly. It didn't resolve the issue at all. Okay, so it's, 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 I, do, I do agree that around the, dem the demand, you know, getting, getting some sensing coming into supply chain and supply chain taking it over, I think that's definitely the way to go there over time. 
And one more comment about security and, and back to the previous question about who's going to pay for all this. In general, what we've seen across industries is that you're being violated to the tune of about 3%, whether you know it or not. This is diverted trade where you're not getting full value for your product because someone's buying low and selling high downstream, and of course, fake goods. So if you're a billion dollar company and you could somehow recover the revenue lost to these illicit traders, then that, that's $30 million that could, in most cases, fall right to the bottom line, particularly on the diversion, because you've made the product, you're just not getting top dollar for it. So you can spread that 30 million in recovered revenue throughout your company to take care of some of these other costs that uh, are, are induced as a result of putting tags on products and so on. Coming back to your uh, question about forecasting, uh, there, there's no breakthrough a methodology that's been developed and magically solving the forecasting problem. Uh, you know, it, it, as long as you're aware of the top, you know, state of the art methodologies, uh, pretty much you're in good shape. And that that's been developed in the last uh, ten years, basically. Uh, but what becomes more of an issue is the quality of data uh, and how relevant it is and how fast you can actually get it. And put it into action. Uh, so there's a good quote from uh, Yahoo CEO. She said, uh, "When it comes to data, earlier is the best. Earlier, earlier the better." I think she said, "Earlier the better." So it's as as long as you can get the data into action quickly, so you can uh, you increase your agility in terms of uh, putting uh, creating the value out of what you have observed in terms of data. Uh, that's the that's the art of it. That's the uh, success uh, of the forecasting mechanism. I think. Going back to the counterfeiting, I have a case that I give to the students. You know, you know, being at home with like four kids, we have you know many iPhones and many iPods. So what I found out is that uh, you know the the cables are lost, so we have to go buy cables on the Amazon. So what I gave to the students, I said, you know, go and find all these different types of cables, put them on a spreadsheet, and I gave them a project to find out if they're good, to find information on what is the quality for those products. They found out that the quality was correlated with very highly with the resp responses, with the score that, you know, the, you know, the customers they will give. And, you know, the, bet the more the people that they answer, and the stars, you know, so I would buy a product which is half the price, if it has a score 4.5, instead of buying an Apple genuine. So we develop a little method of what is the trade-off. Do we buy something which is like 20% and 20% and, and, uh, and, uh, and, uh, and, uh, of the Apple price? Or, you know, do we buy the Apple? We found that it's better for you to buy the genuine Apple instead of going and buying a, a one which is like 20 or 30 or 40 percent. Because the genuine apple is going to stay with you for like four or five years, where the other one is going to be damaged. And um, we, we develop a little technique to do this, you know, with uh, undergraduates and they, you know, we could score them again using scoring. Yeah. That will, it's not counterfeit, but it's right. close to counterfeit. Yeah. Yeah. But you have, through Amazon, we found out that you have all this data. Even if you do some like uh, text analysis, you know, go and uh, put a computer to use a, like, a little text software, you find out the comments. You will get this is bad, this is bad, you know, then you, you won't buy it. So, you know, there are many companies, they do many, many different things to get this data and to develop, uh, like using Twitter, using all the LinkedIn, you know, there's a lot of stuff. One more question. So, uh, first you were talking uh, about the mega um, uh, acquisition of Beckham Dickinson of Fair Fusion, I guess, and, 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 and uh, uh, it's in some ways a uh, characteristic of the industry, and I'm sure um, uh, Ron, um, in your days at J&J, &J, and I'm sure Chris, um, you know, 
while perhaps not every uh, acquisition is a multi-billion dollar, but there are many of those smaller acquisitions. Um, what are the implications to supply chain when an organization is going through an acquisition, especially from a personal standpoint, from the process standpoint? Uh, are there are the certain challenges that you see uh, that organizations have to be more uh, um, cognizant of? And, 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 and what are some of the perhaps uh, um, uh, challenges uh, that are evidence in those kinds of deals that, you know, we are talking about the healthcare, but necessarily I would think it, it characterizes pretty much any industry sector. So in your experiences, both with uh, J&J and Beck and Dickinson, um, what are some of those um, kinds of issues that perhaps when the acquisitions are made, uh, I don't know whether supply chain factors into the, the yeah. decision making when, when, when the valuation is computed. And you know, and usually as you know, well, that's where sometimes those acquisitions don't pan out to be as the finance folks tell us it's going to pan out to be. An interesting last question. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> so um, I'll, I'll offer one or two comments. Yeah. Um, it's all about due diligence, obviously, right? And in the old days, due diligence before an acquisition was around market synergy or more effective use of your sales force to have multiple products in the sales uh, bag and so forth. And I think more recently, you're seeing that, the, to your point, the supply chain is getting much deeper involved in, in many more aspects of the acquisition relative to the due diligence, including vetting the suppliers of the new entity. So it's not just about the top line synergies, it's about the synergies and the integration across uh, technical capabilities. Does the acquisition bring you more production capability or capacity than you had before? What markets are they in? What do they serve? Are the regulations uh, that they bring forward? Are there certifications or things that they bring that could be leveraged across the acquiring company? So I think what you have is your due diligence has to go deeper and broader and start earlier to really look at the validation of that target in so many new ways. Um, and certainly supply integrity and reputation of the company and the brand integrity and so forth are all part of that due diligence. As that gets digested inside the thought of you know, how does this look as an, in, as an integrated company, sometimes decisions are made not to fully integrate that business into the company and have it as a standalone business for those reasons or to leverage some aspects of it but to keep it. It's a lot easier sometimes to acquire a company and to leave them in place, but the integrity of, um, of the due diligence is more important now than ever before. Yeah, I, I, I think what Ron's saying here is 100%. The due diligence is critical. And then, then you get into integration management. Okay, so how are you going to integrate the company into what is known as a new company? Because it's, it's really going to that new company concept uh, that, that you need to look at. And depending on the size, whether it's a small folded in or a substantial one, and you know, there's many of them going on today, more today than there has been for the last three, four years, and probably we'll see more as we go forward over the coming months uh, and, and year, but really making sure you lay out the integration piece and then there's the commitments. Okay, so for every acquisition that goes on, there's a commitment to, to the analysts, stockholders, shareholders at the end of the day. Um, and when you come back to our roles within supply chain, you know, no matter what, where you fit across the supply chain is pretty substantial, okay? So, so usually I'm gonna say, I can see probably 50% of the actual initial integration is going to come out of procurement, at least. Okay, and then you, then you broaden that into your network and into your architecture across that whole supply chain and the synergies that you look for. You look for synergies, okay? And that's really to pay, pave the way to actually help grow top line. So you're hoping you're buying something that fits the company sort of strategy in terms of how you want to actually go into the marketplace uh, as you go forward and you know so that's you know it's not easy to actually do this naturally and companies have done it and they've done it for the wrong reasons in some cases um, 
and they've done it in such a way that you find that you know years later they're carving up carving it off and, and selling on okay so lots of lots of sort of case studies out there on, on that particular topic um, but I'm sure you're going to see a lot more coming up bring a different perspective maybe about consolidation and supply chain management some of those uh, acquisition decisions are actually part of supply chain strategy. So uh, it's not about merging with another company, but it's rather about consolidating your own supply chain, purchasing your distributor, purchasing your supplier, so that uh, you, you get to have uh, better efficiencies in terms of managing the supply chain, in terms of having more deeper control over your supply chain. Uh, you know, it goes, goes with uh, probably uh, supply integrity and uh, Mm -hmm. yep. And Good overall, uh, both cost perspectives, uh, security perspectives, and control, uh, basically, uh, which which uh, could be uh, leveraged in, in many different ways. Uh, yep. So to to close and you know to to uh, create some imaginations, thirty years back you had Amazon starting selling books, you know, on the internet. Now that company competes with IBM on the cloud. Right. Who could imagine like a company selling books on the internet now will compete, uh, you know, uh, with IBM on the cloud from a strategic point of view, not by acquisition because they had servers, you know, 10 years back and want to use it. So they got the idea to, to, uh, to use those servers during the night. So imagine what's going to happen in the next 10, 20 years. You know, the, it's very open technology. Right. So this is supply chain problem. It's all fulfillment. It's all fulfillment. So first of all, thank you all for coming. Thank you to the panel. I think uh, it was a very helpful, excellent discussion today. And uh... good luck. Here.